Hello and welcome everyone to the expert interview series from Revolution in Simulation. Today we have a special guest with us. His name is Tim Hunter and he's a founder of Wolfstar Technologies, developer of the True Load reconstruction software. Prior to founding this company, Tim spent bulk of his time at Harley Davidson, an envious place indeed to, to, be, to be employed. He ultimately retired as a chief engineer of vehicle systems. However, he was always very, very interested and enthusiastic about his career in structural analysis. And even though he was groomed as a management and as an executive leadership person, he continued to perform FEA until his last day of employment. At, at Harley, he was best known for his leadership in frame systems where he developed true loads software and many other power analytical techniques. Tim has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Market University and has earned MS and PhD in engineering from University of Milwaukee. His PhD focused on FEA-based fatigue, which was not existent at that time. He has developed several novel energy-based fatigue modulus, which was deployed in his FEA-based fatigue tool as part of his dissertation. He has had a long and illustrious career and raised two daughters who also are STEM graduates. He lives in Milwaukee and enjoys lots of camping vacations along with his wife and his pet dog. Welcome, Tim, and I would now hand, hand, hand it over to you to introduce yourself and give us some background about your company. Okay, well, great. Thank you, Sandeepak. And all that time doing FEA analysis as I was being trained in management, it was keeping me sane. Okay, I had to do it for my sanity. So, so okay. So, um, so I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm going to show my screen here and just kind of introduce you to um, our our software and our company, and just so so you can see what's going on here. So, uh, just one minute here, and I'll get that going. And is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, looks good. So. So um, this is just gonna be a quick overview about our true load software. Uh, again, a little introduce, introduction to me. Sandeepak already talked about many of these things, but uh, we founded uh, Wolfstar Technologies back in 2010. And um, it was founded by me. Prior to that, I was at Harley Davidson for 22 years. I was chief engineer of vehicle structures. And uh, I've had kind of like lots of nice technical accomplishments. I developed uh, a topology optimization at about the same time Optistruct came out. I developed metal. Uh, uh, I developed uh, FEA-based fatigue about the same time FE Safe came out, <laughs> and then I, when I developed true load load reconstruction software, I said I'm going to take that to market. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> um, our tool set at Wolfstar, you know, we basically use FE every FEA tool out there. So FEMAP, Abacus, SimCenter, Ansys, and we use fatigue tools like FE Safe, and we got our own. Um, our own Wolfstar-based uh, fatigue tool for working on signals. Um, and we've got our whole true load suite of software. And uh, we've got great development partners. Um, Dassault Systems, Ansys, MSC, Siemens, they've been with us from the very beginning. And CETRON is the company that we're using as our API plugin so we can access, access your FEA uh, models and do great visualization. So the products from Wolfstar Technologies, okay? Our flagship product is a product we call True Load and it basically turns components into load transducers. It's really really what we're doing. We're leveraging this technology called load reconstruction to do that. And what'll happen when the customers use this is we'll get time histories of loading that map back to individual result sets in your FEA model. Another tool that we've got here is a tool we call True QSE. QSE stands for quasi-static events. And basically this allows you to linearly superimpose results by user-defined functions, and that by itself is great. But what happens is when our customers are using our load reconstruction tool, True Load, they get time histories of loading that map back to results, and then True QSE becomes a way that they can back expand those results and query any node or element for any stress and strain response, and even generate offering deflection shapes. So True QSE is a really big important part of our package that we give to our customers. And thirdly, we've got a tool called True LDE, stands for Linear Dynamic Events. And this is basically a post processor for linear dynamic solutions. Most FEA post processors aren't really designed around linear dynamics. And so this is really tuned for looking at linear dynamic results. Your, your solutions solve a lot faster when we use our tool. And we've got 
excellent tools in there. One of the things we can do, and we, we can convert your, free, your, your results from time, frequency, and PSD domains with just a push of a button. So this is really powerful tools in the true LDE product. And all of our tools, since we're so concerned about loading, we, uh, we push that loading off to the major FEA-based fatigue softwares out there. Because the fatigue softwares out there are great, but they're no good unless you give them the proper loading uh, uh, duty cycles. So we're, we're all about making sure we get the right duty cycles out to these FEA-based fatigue softwares. So this is our suite of tools here. This is a, you know, this little slide here is, you know, the solution we're trying to an answer here. And I, I, I had a slide for answers, but this is, you know, what's the analysis user's biggest challenge, okay? The problem is, what's the load, okay? So if you're a design engineer that's got designed products for this motorcycle here, and they've got to be durable, and they've got to function, but the loading is so crazy nonlinear, you can't measure the load, you can't simulate load, what do you do? You still have to deliver those products and design them properly. So we basically recognize that all the parts basically respond linearly. So we're going to put strain gauges on the swing arm, the frame, the handlebars, the fenders, the, the fuel system, the luggage system. We'll put strain gauges in all these subsystems and turn those subsystems into their own load transducers. And then we can use those loads to do design and optimizations of the parts. This is what we're doing. We're turning the part, the, the motorcycle into its own load transducer. Um, this is a first-to-market technology. It's based on something called influence coefficients. Influence coefficients have been around for a long time, 50, 60 years. The problem is that traditionally they were done manually. So people have got poor strain gauge placement, poor correlation matrices, and they'd go through all this work and go to the field and they get poor results. So it never quite caught on. And what we're doing is we're leveraging the FEA model and scripting and optimization to get you the optimal correlation matrices and the optical strain, strain gauge placement. This is really what we're doing here. So um, historical, uh, uh, you know, things with with uh, with doing loading is is you know companies typically will use things like these load transducers here, and load transducers are perfectly fine things. They they are good and wonderful things. But the problem is every time you use one of these things, you've got to change your product. You've got to cut out metal, insert this load transducer. You'll measure the load, but now you've just changed the mass and the stiffness, so that load may not be correct. And to add insult to injury, the analyst is typically working on the as design part, and they've got to change your FEA model to match the test part that you just got given the loads for. So that's, it's not perfect, but this is what uh, uh, companies traditionally do. And another thing that people try to do is, is use strain gauges. So typically an analyst will look at the FEA model, and they'll say, hey, let's lay some strain gauges in these locations. They'll talk to their colleague, come up with some more. They might come up with 30 or 40 strain gauges. They go instrument the part field, and they get the time histories of strain back, and they look at the time histories, and they look at the FEA model, and they scratch their heads. Nothing makes sense. The loading in the field is so complex versus what they've got in their FEA model, and they'll spend days, if not weeks, just trying to get one or two strain gauge, gauges to match at one or two points in time, and that's just qualitatively, not even quantitatively, and then they use that for their, their loading scenarios, and then they go through, and they do redesign, and they get back to the field, and they might have the same problems or new problems, and they repeat the cycle all over, okay? I have done this. I'm sure many of you have done that, this as well. This is just a problem with FEA and testing. So you don't want to do any of these things. We've got a solution for you, and this is true load product that will really get you the right loading for your structure so you can do design and optimization, okay? So that's a really brief intro into the product here. I can I can go on for another half an hour, but I think I think we've got the idea here, okay? So um, turn it back over to you, Sandeep Yuck. Sure. So the next uh, obvious, very, very fascinating. And the next obvious question that comes to my mind is a number of us who have worked in the, let's say, simulation or computational modeling industry always come up with, uh, let's say, some idea or other. The difficult part always is to turn it into an actual operating business. So, and usually there's some sort of a story associated with uh, with the whole thing. So what's your story? And it, it, is, it is it is very important for me to know about it personally, but at the same time to our audiences, uh, it, will, it will be very fascinating to learn how you decided to convert your technical acumen into a business. Well, um, well, you know how, how they say we learn from our mistakes? Well, sometimes we do a lot of learning, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was, uh, I was the uh, head engineer for frame, for the 2003 Sportster frame redesign at Harley Davidson, and I had FEA models. I had great loading. I had I had really thought I had done this thing all right. I was down at the factory building the the frames for the DIB build, the design intent build. So this is the last build before you commit to tooling. Okay, so. 
Uh, so I'm down at the I'm down at the weld shop working with the welders. We're building frames. I get a call from the test track. They say, "Hey Tim, all these frames you just made, they're all junk. Okay, you've got 4,000 micro strains on the down tubes. So everything we're building is just junk. Okay. So this was the two this was the 2003 model year for Harley Davidson. This was going to be the 100th anniversary bike. Okay." <laughs> so now I've got to go home to my boss, VP of engineering, president of the company says, yeah, the 100th anniversary bike is going to be the 2004 model year bike. <laughs> okay, so and I just had my wood home and I scratched my head and said, what's going on? This is all linear elastic. I've got good models. What's going on? So I, I worked on the problem and kind of figured things out for a little bit. I got stuck on some math. I hired a professor from the university to get me past that. When you hire a professor, the first thing they do is they look up papers, right? And he looked up these papers and says, Tim, this problem's been already solved. Okay. <laughs> so, so basically, we kind of got the published papers and, and basically make that operational. So so this, that's how I got into this. And I knew we had a solution that we had to get to the market. So, Perfect. So another fascinating aspect of this software is that uh, it, it actually requires a certain level of uh, expertise in being able to test, right? And that is always uh, an area that I personally give a lot of credit to because I kind of I barely escaped an F in my experimental fluid dynamics class. So can you give give us some sense of uh, what it takes to implement this software in in an industrial sort of an environment? Yeah, so um, this works ideally best when you've got a test department and an analytical department working together cooperatively. And Oftentimes, I go into customers, and I, and we'll go into meetings in our, our first introductory meeting, and we'll they'll have a group of test engineers, and they'll have a group of analysis engineers, and there is a war going on in that conference room, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> and and it was very interesting. Is is what happens with my software is that all of a sudden now you've got the the, in the analytical engineer using my software to strategically lay out strain gauge placement. And now he's talking to the test engineer and saying, hey, does this work for you? And they're working together to figure out that the instrumentation strategy. And and another nice thing is that we're placing strain gauges in nice nominal areas for their, so they're easier for the test guys to lay. And then what happens to is then after they get that instrumentation plan going and they, they do the testing, now you've got the analytical engineer he can't wait until till the test data comes because he needs the test data to get his loads. So, so you've kind of gone from this, this kind of oppositional atmosphere that goes on oftentimes in companies between analysis and test to kind of a kumbaya moment. Now you've got these two departments working together cooperatively and, and one's, one's really gaining a respect for the other and we're getting these perfect strain correlation plots and it's, it's like it's just moving the whole process forward so much nicer. So. So now, uh, currently, if you look at anything to do with simulation, the only word, or for that matter, anything really, not necessarily just simulation, the only word that we are hearing is AI, right? So uh, how do you see AI affecting this entire test plus simulation uh, ecosystem? And how does your software play a role in, in this? How does it fit in this overall workflow as AI becomes more and more dominant? I think there could be solutions where, where on families of parts, we could get AI to train, to get trained and get the gauge placement in a in a methodical fashion. I think there's something that we could do on families of parts like that. But I really, what I really see this, you know, some of the future for for my software is, is that, you know, with all this uh, looking into VR, uh, virtual reality, and augmented reality glasses, we've got the technology, you know, with the with the simulation tools I've got got the technology almost right now where you could put on VR glasses and gloves and rather than doing a computer screen and laying your strain gauge with a computer screen you could you could be touching your, your 3D model and laying things out with with your VR gloves in your hands you could be placing strain gauges virtually with your hands in VR and then if we took that to the next step of augmented reality now we could pass those models on to the test engineer now the test engineer with the augmented reality could have the virtual part overlaying the physical part as he's laying the strain gauges. So you'd be wow. able to have you'd be able to have this this you know this immersion of the technologies between physical and virtual in in that space, and you could take it a step further. You know you could, we've all got cell phones, right? I could take this cell phone here, and 
I could use my cell phone to be a 3D digitizer for my coffee mug here. So I could do a 3D tessellated model of my coffee mug here. I could have some very quick and easy FBA tools online, right? Where I could come in, I could po poke at my coffee mug and tell it where I want to put loads. And then from those loads then, my software could kick in and say, these are where strain gauges are, and we could we could adjust those strain gauges and then pass it over. So, I mean, there's there's a real, I mean, there's a real, every, all the pieces are there where we can make that happen, where you can go from your phone, digitizing something, like within hours, be doing a, a virtual load reconstruction on a physical part. I mean, it's... I can taste it, you know. <laughs> it's just like one of those things that's just like ready to go. Yeah, that, that will and be a all, fun project to work on. And all of the pieces are there. All of the pieces are there to make that happen. It's just great, you know. So yeah. perfect. So uh, coming towards the end, a uh, lot of our audience is actually young professionals uh, entering into the industry within the first five, seven years of their career. What advice would you give them as they look at, let's say, building their career over next? Uh, couple of decades, uh, particularly in finite element analysis, structural mechanics, computational modeling in general? Yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough for a structural engineer, for a, for an FE analyst going into the field. They, they need to get engaged with the test lab and really understand the testing. And they need to build friendships in the test lab and really understand the testing environment and actually get the opportunity to do some testing. When, when you, when you've got testing under your belt, you're a better structural analysis guy because you understand the real world and how things happen. And and to just to be able to to go in and work with test engineers and take and basically model what they're doing in the lab, and do it in the computer, making sure you're getting the same results. Those types of things are just you just learn so much from that because it's easy to sit at your desk and make assumptions and say the real world works this way, but it's it's a whole other thing when you've got to touch the real world and, <laughs> and see what actually happens. So, so, so Tim, uh, uh, back for a moment to the uh, AI topic and coupling it with, uh, with the question that uh, Sandeep had just asked. I could imagine, for instance, that uh, you would, uh, students could use a trained AI to help them uh, explore a whole bunch of what-if scenarios. You talk about them going into the lab and actually seeing things happen makes perfect sense, of course. However, those are uh, your point data. You might right. see one lab result. If you're lucky, you'll see two. With AI, a well-trained AI, you could start having a conversation as though you were having it with an expert that tests various what-if scenarios. What do you think about that? Yes, I, I do think that's very much the case. And the the AI simulation tools where you can take simulations that normally run in days and get them down to seconds now. I mean, the whole world just opens up for that. And and you're right. A test environment is is testing one very small slice point of the domain. And and you it's good to understand that. But the beauty of simulation and, and AI tools is in that that okay, you've got that point as a reference point, but now you can explore the whole domain. And that, that's the power of simulation in general. You know, that, that's the power of simulation, is that now you've got tools to explore the whole domain, but you need to be anchored in the real world too in order to do that, so, yeah. Well, it's very specifically the fact that, that students are not anchored in the real world that have led simulation engineers to create silos that are quite separate from the uh, physical testing domain resulting in the problems that you just mentioned. Yes. So I went to one of the major automotive manufacturers years ago and did a, did a true load project with them. And I remember talking to the, the manager of the analysis department and he just looked at me point blank and says, why would I ever want to correlate to test? And I just had to turn around and walk away. <laughs> I couldn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, that is that certainly is an extreme case, but uh, you know, God alone knows how often you see that out there. Right, right. He's had that. People have that attitude. They may not express it as bluntly as he did, but the, that that attitude results in you know pretty pictures and animations that uh, are totally meaningless. Right. You can make the most beautiful pictures that mean absolutely nothing. Yes. <laughs> in fact it was much more eye-opening to see that video of yours with the with that uh, motocross bike and scratch your head and imagine what kinds of nasty loads that, <laughs> that motorbike is subjected to yes you know it's, it's pretty amazing 
Yes, and 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 so I, you know, just uh, just last week I was working with one of my customers, Royal Enfield uh, in India, and they're having the exact same problem. And so it's it great. So so it's okay, get your your vehicle instrument in this. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun to do it with it. You know? So yeah. Sure. So, uh, excellent, fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm sure, Malcolm. I think we will have Tim uh, in further episodes of uh, this uh, Talk with Experts series. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, for your time today, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you and learning from you in future episodes of this uh, this uh, Talk to Experts series. Well, great. Thank well, thank again. you all. This is a great opportunity. Thank you, Tim.